Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 366. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Want the latest interventions for working with complex trauma in adolescents and adults? Register for John Briere's five-day workshop in Cancun this February at leadingedgecancun.com and use promo code JOHN50 to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time. You'll save up to $1,500. Space is limited, so register today for 50% off your room when you register for John Briere's complex trauma workshop using code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com. New registrations only. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am excited to share with you an interview with someone who taught me a lot during our conversation. I have specialized in perfectionist, perfectionism for a while myself and as a therapist, and I have counted myself as a recovering perfectionist for at least eight years. But I found this conversation really enlightening because my guest, Catherine Morgan Schaffler, is talking about perfectionism in a different way. For one, she's taking away some of the stigma from that label, which I appreciate because I realized as we were talking that even my way of talking about perfectionism has a kind of a negative slant to it because I I judge myself for the ways that I do these behaviors and I don't I don't want to be beholden to a pattern that is kind of holding me prisoner where you know I have to do things a certain way I don't like feeling like I have to beat myself up if I make a mistake or if everything's not exactly the way I wanted it to be which is really not even making a mistake. It's just more of a natural reality that things are never going to be exactly the way you want them to be all the time. So obvious. But yeah, I think what I feel judgmental about, about my perfectionistic tendencies is the way that I am clinging to some effort to feel in control. And I get mad at myself about that. But the truth is I'm doing that because I feel scared or feel like I need to grab more tightly because things are feeling very out of control. And that's something that I should be able to have more compassion for myself about. And at the same time, I just noticed that I said I should be able to have more compassion. So even there, I'm judging myself. But it's a work in progress. And I really like the way that my guest, Catherine Morgan Scheffler, speaks about perfectionism and its positive qualities, as well as how letting go of control can really be beneficial. And she has a new book that's coming out. It might be out as of now when you're listening to this. It's coming out very soon. So let me tell you a little bit more about my guest. Catherine Morgan Schaffler is a psychotherapist, writer, and speaker, former on-site therapist at Google, who has earned degrees and trained at UC Berkeley and Columbia University with postgraduate certification from the Association for Spirituality and Psychotherapy in New York City. And her new book is called The Perfectionist's Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. And actually, as I'm recording this, the episode, the uh, book actually comes out today. So by the time you're hearing this, 
it will be available for purchase and I'll have a link in the show notes. I'm definitely going to invite her back and I'm hoping she'll be able to return. We actually had scheduled it and we were going to do it, but my puppy was sick and I had to take her to the vet. So I had to cancel. Real life intrudes again on the fun of podcasting, but And as you know, if you've been listening, I had COVID after that. December was kind of a chaotic month, but it's okay because things are looking up in many aspects of life. And so I'm grateful to have gotten through that very challenging time. And I'm hoping that get a little bit more of a experience of some smoothness. If not, I'll try to remind myself that it will be over eventually and things will get better. So. I hope your 2023 is starting off smoothly or with ease or with peace, rest, joy, pleasure, fun, wonder, awe, excitement. (sighs) There have definitely been some really good things that have happened this month, and I'm so grateful for that. So I will tell you a couple things before we get into the conversation with Catherine. One is I wanted to make sure you were paying attention last week. If you listened to my interview with Dr. John Briere about complex trauma and how the therapist can regain mindful attunement within and to the other, meaning the client. And of course, this is something that everyone can do using the regain practice that he shared and some more information that he's going to teach and give people the opportunity to practice in his training in Cancun, which is in February. So if you were listening to that and you were thinking about going to the training, I just want to be sure you heard that there's a special discount on accommodations. So this Cancun training vacation experience includes an all-inclusive hotel stay at a beautiful luxury resort. And for John Briere's training only, you can save 50% on accommodations if you book your training and accommodations at the same time. So I talked about that in the in this week's ads for the episode. So I just want to make sure you didn't miss that. There's a link in the show notes where you can sign up or just go to leadingedgecancun.com and you'll find his training and you can sign up using the code, I think it's John 50 So definitely check that out if you are looking for an opportunity to get some R&R in Cancun while also getting CEUs. I am definitely going to be doing that. Unfortunately, I can't attend John's training, but I'll be there for a different training during next month. So if you're going, let me know and I'd be excited to meet up with you. All right, let's see. Also wanted to tell you, oh yeah, also if you are interested in going into private practice or growing your practice, bringing in more clients to your practice, if you already have one, expanding into group practice, for any of those opportunities for therapists, Zinni Me, who I have partnered with and I have worked with since I started my practice. Well, actually, I started my practice in 2013 and I started working with them in 2014 and they are the ones that really helped me grow it. They have some free webinars coming up in February and I'll put a link in the show notes for you to learn more about those. But um, I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. I'll talk more about it in future episodes. So Let's get into my conversation with Katherine Morgan Schaffler about perfectionism, its positive aspects, and the positive aspects of letting go of control, how that can help us to have more peace and a real true sense of power. Let's dive in. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so excited to be speaking with Catherine Morgan Schaffler. Catherine, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I have been listening to a lot of your podcasts, and there's so there's such a breadth. It's hundreds that you've done, and it's so incredible how deeply you go into each and every episode. They're all really rich, and I 
am so appreciative of getting to be a part of that. So thanks for having me. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. That's so kind of you to say. And I know that this conversation will be no different, especially, you know, even as we started chatting before recording, we already got into some really interesting stuff. So I'm really excited to talk to you, especially about your book, The Perfectionist's Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. But before we get into the book, let's just start off by you telling our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yes. So I am a psychotherapist in New York City, and I work mostly with women who can present really well, seem completely put together when they want to be, and whose problems are not apparent to others. So these are high functioning, is the clinical term for it, really high achieving women and some men who are navigating all the things that, you know, happen when you can function at a level in which your problems aren't necessarily apparent. And that's where, in my opinion, things can get really interesting when you're adept at hiding your suffering as the highly functional person is. You know, we can we'll get into it more and I get into it a lot in my book, but it's harder to ask for help, to recognize you need help, to have other people ask you for help because, you know, the gift of a crisis is that there's always, it's obvious, like something has happened And, you know, immediate reparative measures need to be taken. And when you're a really high-functioning person, as a lot of my clients are, you're not necessarily going to hit a crisis in the same way. And you have to be the one to signal the flare. And that can be really hard. And I think for a lot of perfectionists, it can feel, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say it feels like a failure just to do something like asking for help. And so... Those are the kinds of people that I work with. I was also the on-site therapist at Google for a while, and that was really fun and interesting too. I started out my work in residential treatment with kids who were abused and neglected, who became wards of the state and in and out of foster care, and a lot of social work stuff for the first few years of my career, and I slowly transitioned into private practice, and now I've written a book. So that's the arc of my bio. Well, thank you. And, you know, just hearing about you talk about your clients, it makes me think about, especially when you said people who are really good at hiding their suffering, you know, being high functioning means you're really good at hiding your suffering, which is interesting because it's acknowledging that we all are suffering. (laughs) Everybody is suffering. And I think it seems like a good thing to be able to say, well, I can keep this low key or I can keep this hidden in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're high functioning, you're suffering and hiding it, but it's easier to. And I think it's sometimes even hidden from our own awareness in some ways, such that you're going about your daily business, you're never late to work, you know, your house is in order, all that stuff is happening. And then you kind of get caught off guard by something and it makes you realize I'm not doing okay. Like this, you know, shouldn't have thrown me in this way. What's going on? So I think for the highly functioning person, it can, you know, these barometers that we use to measure our mental health are sometimes calibrated against an external standard when the greatest calibration is always internal and always looking within yourself and asking yourself how you're doing, not looking to your life and saying, what am I doing or how much am I doing? Because you can do a lot and you can be doing, you know, you can be very productive and not be okay. Yeah. And our culture really encourages us to be really, really, really productive and to look like we're okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, you can you can be productive and still be OK. I think something that's starting to happen is productivity. And I talk about this in The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control. Productivity is becoming like the dirtiest word in self-help and the dirtiest word in wellness. And I have a, somewhat of a pushback to that because I'm, I'm like, it's OK to be productive when what you're doing is aligned with your value system. When productivity mm. becomes a negative thing is when you're being productive for the sake of being productive. When you're doing stuff that you don't really give a shit about, when you're doing things to prove that you're doing okay. Well, look, my whole house is clean or look, like I answered all my emails. So that means I'm I'm good, right? And it doesn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, I hear that binary is just, you know, it's like productivity is not bad. Perfectionism is not bad or good. Productivity is not good. Perfectionism is not good. You know, they're they can be good for us and they can be bad for us. Yeah. In mental health, I'm so glad you said that because mental health is so much more context dependent mm -hmm. than we currently perceive it to be. This dichotomous thinking of, you know, this is good and this is bad and I'm healthy and now I'm sick is just not the way mental health works. It's so fluid, so, so, so fluid. And you can be doing really, really well one day and then be in a certain context and, you know, really start to flail. And our understanding of the fluidity, I think, really helps us to stop pathologizing something in ourselves. Just like it's fluid for everybody. Mental health comes and goes in all kinds of ways that is the nature of being a human being you know yeah like physical health right it's like today i have a cough you know tomorrow i have a headache the next day i don't have either of those things you know uh -huh. it doesn't mean i'm a sick person today because i have a cough right yeah 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 i think we need a lot more of that move away from black and white thinking and being in the middle the the nuance in every way Yes, I, I have a part of the book about that because I had a professor in grad school, my favorite professor, Dr. Anika Warren, and she always said, you have to learn how to live in the gray. And in my old, in an old office, I had this huge print that just said in, in gray, the letters I-S-H to spell ish. And I love when people use the word ish, when they say like, I'm depressed ish, I'm good ish, <laughs> you know, like. I'm fine. Ish is like the anthem that you sing when you have learned to live in the gray mm -hmm. instead of like, I am the best. I'm doing great. I'm doing all this stuff. Or like you're peeling yourself off the floor. It's, it's like incorporating ish into your language, I think, is a great way to, to start changing the way that you're thinking. Yeah, I like that. It's a nice reminder having it on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I need reminders on the wall, basically, with everything. <laughs> That's me. I have sticky notes. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about why you titled the book, The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, and, and what it means when you say it's a path to peace and power. Yeah. So I think perfectionism is a power in and of itself. And I think of it like any power, like the power of love or the power of wealth or the power of beauty. Every power needs to be managed. And I think what we've done with perfectionism is kind of minimize it and squeeze it into this little ring box in which it doesn't fit into. It's a very multidimensional construct. It shows up in a variety of ways and unfurls itself in an individual way. So we think of the perfectionist as the type A, rigid, kind of like super organized, perfect, precise archetype. But the truth is that perfectionism comes in, in such a wide range of experiences, both cognitively, emotionally, physically, but also personality-wise and relationally. Like, some the five the five types of perfectionists. Well, I I guess I'll get into that later and I'll answer your question first. So the perfectionist guide to losing control is about I think the negative part of that power of perfectionism, which is I want to try to control everything. That's a very humanistic impulse to control because if we can control, we can predict, and if we can predict, we can stay safe, and we're wired for that in a certain way. And when you're able to let go of control, which is always illusory, we really can't control very much in life, you're kind of free falling unless you can center yourself in some kind of power. And so that's what I really get into in the book is what is power? What's the difference between control and power? How do you find personal power? And the so the perfectionist guide to losing control is about letting go of this idea that you can control everything because you can't. And A Path to Peace and Power, which is a subtitle my brilliant editor, Nikki Papadopoulos, came up with, is, is very intentional in that it's a path. There's not only one path. There are always multiple solutions. It's something I really believe in. 
So this is a path and it's a path to peace and power, which is not a path to constant happiness. This isn't a book about, you know, how to become a different person and how to be perpetually cheerful and do all the things that our culture sometimes tells us healthy people do. It's a path to find some peace within yourself and some power so that you're not constantly moving through your day trying to control every single thing that comes at you, which is a formula for exhaustion. Yeah, that part, trying to control every single thing that comes at you. It's, you know, I was saying to the, this to you before we started recording that I see that stereotype of the type A person who needs everything to be exactly a certain way. And if it isn't, they're, you know, trying to force that on other people and stuff like that. That's a, that's something that when someone has those ways of coping, the other people in their lives often don't understand, you know, why they're like that. But it's, if you feel the need to control everything that's happening around you, which is impossible. So you're constantly, you know, struggling because you're, everything's not the way you wish it were. Yeah. That's not, that doesn't feel good at all. You know, it's not something that the, the person enjoys. Yeah. And there's, there's a little bit of danger to that too, because there is intermittent reward. Like sometimes you can control a little bit of it and then you're like, oh, I get, I can control stuff. So let me just keep getting better at doing that. And so the intermittent reward is like how you get stuck in the game. Yeah. So let's talk about those different types of perfectionism that you've identified, because it's not just that that idea that we just talked about, but there are a lot of different ways it can show up. Can you can you go through those? Yes. So the five types are classic, which we just kind of talked about. So this is the very sort of preppy, put together person who, you know, never looks like they perpetually just got a haircut and <laughs> has a spreadsheet for everything and goes on vacation with an itiner itinerary and that kind of thing. A Parisian perfectionist is someone who wants to be perfectly liked. And I named that archetype Parisian after Parisian women and their sort of relationship with beauty, which is there is an effortless look to their beauty, but a whole lot of work is happening behind the scenes, right? And that's part of the thing. So Parisian perfectionists want to be perfectly liked, want to do a great job, want to excel, but they don't like to look like they're trying too hard. They want it to be effortless. And then there are intense perfectionists. And this is more the sort of Gordon Ramsay, Steve Jobs type where, you know, you excel at being direct, at being very clear about what you want. You, you obviously hold high standards and you hold other people to those standards. But the underbelly to this type of perfectionism is that your high standards can quickly metastasize into impossible standards. And you can be really punitive with yourself and other people when they don't meet those impossible standards. So to take a step back here, all of these types of perfectionisms have really wonderful attributes and all of them have negative underbellies because they're all powerful. And that is the nature of every power is that it can be good and destructive, constructive and, and destructive. Then there's messy perfectionists and messy perfectionists are in love with starting things. They're, they're like start happy, but they want the middle of the process to stay perfect and it never does. So messy perfectionists kind of cast a wide net. They want to do all of the things, but they encounter real trouble and confusion when it becomes apparent that you have to make decisions about what you're going to do because... <laughs> We're limited as human beings, you know, in terms of what we can devote our time and energy to. So messy perfectionists are sort of like this, the romantics who want to, you know, change the world and start a podcast and like become an Airbnb super host and like continue doing their full time job and have three children and do all of these things. And they start all of that stuff, but they can't bring those things to completion because the middle isn't perfect and they have to encounter the, the difficulty of that. And then the counterpart to messy perfectionists are procrastinator perfectionists who wait for the starting conditions to be perfect before they begin. So these are the people who like over plan and over prepare because everything has to be lined up before 
they can begin something. And so, you know, the the great quality about this is that these are not, these are people with great impulse control. They're not going to just go out and do something without thinking it through. And the challenge that comes up is how much do you have to prepare before you're ready? You know, is anyone ever really ready to do something before you start doing it? I'm not. Like, I'm an experiential learner. I need to I need to do it to learn how to do it. But I'm more of a messy perfectionist than a procrastinator perfectionist. So my problem is like, yeah, I need to do it to learn how to do it. But that doesn't mean you can't give yourself the gift of some slight tutorials around something. <laughs> Why are you pointing to yeah, yourself? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm identifying myself there as the messy perfectionist. Although, yeah. you know, I think I would like to be, I would like to be a Parisian perfect, perfectionist as well, but I just don't think I'm good enough to make it seem effortless, <laughs> but I well, wish it would. <laughs> you know, I think the effortlessness is, well, the strength of a Parisian perfectionist is they are, they have a live wire understanding of the power of connection. And that's why connection is so paramount to them. They're very empathic naturally. But the drawback is when your perfectionism is not being managed well, you are doing some very dangerous people pleasing and abandoning of yourself. And when you try to make something look effortless, it's like effortless for what? So that people think that you're put together. Why do you need people to invest in that idea of you? Because you're scared of them knowing that you're having a hard time. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we kind of begin to pull the string and unravel some of, you know, the vulnerabilities and defense mechanisms associated with that particular type. So be careful what you wish for, is what I'm saying, because being able to, again, this goes to the top of our conversation, hide all of your problems or hide the difficulty to which something took you before you were able to show up, it doesn't really engender connection with other people and it does the opposite of what a Parisian perfectionist is looking for. You're actually shutting people out because you're not being open about something we all struggle with and have to learn to manage, which is like things aren't easy all the time. Some things are hard. We all need help. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Thanks to Leading Edge Seminars for sponsoring this week's episode. If you're looking for the latest interventions for working with complex trauma in adolescents and adults, then register for Dr. John Briere's five-day workshop in Cancun this February and use promo code JOHN50 to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time at leadingedgecancun.com. You'll save up to $1,500. At this unique learning and vacation experience, you'll train in the morning, then have afternoons for fun at an all-inclusive luxury resort on the beach. Spots are filling up, so visit LeadingEdgeCancun.com and save 50% on your hotel room when you register for John's Complex Trauma Workshop at the same time using code JOHN50. New registrations only. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, that under part definitely resonates for the Parisian, but the messy, I feel like, I can't hide <laughs> how messy my process is. So yeah. it's like, I wish it could look effortless, but I know, I feel like there's no hiding this. It's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, here it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and messy meaning like, I don't mean that perfectionists uh, that are messy perfectionists literally create messes around themselves. I just mean they get their hands in so many different kinds of pots 
that it all becomes blurry for them. And at yeah. some point you're like, wait, what is the thing I most want to do? You can't most want to do 25 things, you know? Right. So at least not to- all at the same time. And right. Right. So there's just no hierarchy. And I think that that gets messy in our minds. It makes your mind messy. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm I'm just, you know, being hard on myself by saying messy in a negative way. But also, there's a lot of times where I feel like that, like, oh, my gosh, I cannot. Like, why did I take on all this stuff? So and I think that I would like to talk about that a little bit, like, you know, that idea of ambition, drive, striving for achievement. Mm -hmm. And the like, there's, there's like a mixed message we get in society about what you should be doing to be quote successful, Mm -hmm. but also how you should be doing it supposed to look a certain way and be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Or you're doing it wrong. And then that like, is like a shame thing. It seems. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one trend that I notice now is that productivity is becoming like the dirtiest word in self-help and wellness and kind of telling people abandon productivity, fuck productivity, like being productive means that you are not being true to yourself. And I think that message comes is coming from a really essential, important place of like, listen, rest, as I talk about in the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, rest is not a preference. Rest is a need. And if you want any level, whatever success means to you, of sustained success, attaining success and sustaining success are two different things. And if you want to sustain success, you need to be rested. You can't just be a robot. You can't just be a productivity machine. But on the other hand of that, it's like productivity, especially for perfectionists of any type, feels good. And dare I say, productivity is healthy, perfectly healthy, as long as your productivity is aligned with your value system. When productivity becomes unhealthy and destructive instead of healthy and constructive is when You're being productive based on what someone else tells you is important or you're being productive based on pursuing someone else's vision of success. And, you know, if we go 30,000 feet in the air, you can say that we all have a generic version of success, which culture sells us. And that's that's basically like faster, better, bigger, more of everything. And it's our job as individuals who want to step into our power to say, what do I want less of? What do I want more of? Why do I want those things? How do I know that? And to really be introspective and thoughtful about framing our own definitions of success. And that's part of what finding your power means is creating a self-defined understanding of what success means to you. Yeah. So can you can you go into a little more about what it would look like to have your productivity aligned with your values? Because I'm guessing it's more than about work productivity. Yeah. So for example, if if one of your values is that you really want to be connective and you really want to connect to the people that matter to you in your circle, right? Your family, your colleagues, whomever it is, your your listeners, whatever that is, then connection becomes what you are trying to be productive at. And that might mean that you spend, you know, an hour reading survey results or something from your listeners about what they really loved about your podcast and what they were maybe confused about or would love to hear even more of. And you, because you spent an hour doing that, that means that you can't spend an hour, you know, responding to emails and getting to inbox zero or whatever. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that you were unproductive. And if you know where your priorities are and what your values are, you can say, I feel really productive. I just read all of that feedback. I I really have a clear understanding of what my listeners want. Now I can go and be even more connective, which is why I started this podcast in the first place. This is great and allowing that to feel good. And when you see that you have 72 emails, not saying, oh, Gosh, I I don't know how I let that slip. I just need to get my shit together. I'm really gotta, gotta figure this out. You say like, that's, I have 72 emails because responding to emails 
is not as important to me as connecting to my listeners and the people in my life that matter to me. And so it just becomes more clear. And you're, and then you stop scrambling to do both. And when you scramble to do both, you don't do either very well. And then you feel badly because you didn't get to your 72 emails and you also didn't get to understand what the people who you're doing all this work for even want. Yeah. And you might have spent that hour beating yourself up about either should I focus on the survey or should I respond to the emails? I can't do either one because I'm just feeling like a big failure. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I have a whole chapter about that because if I could tell anybody anything about dismantling our rigid notion, ironically rigid notion of what perfectionism is. It's not, it's that it's not perfectionism that is your problem. It's that you are responding to missteps with punishment instead of self-compassion. And some of the brightest, most successful by their own standards and often ours, most wonderful contributors to society are perfectionists. And they got to that place by being compassionate with themselves instead of staying stuck in punitive patterns that only make everything worse. Well, punishment does not work. And we don't understand that. We don't understand it as individuals and we don't understand it as a culture, which is why I dedicated a whole chapter on it, because I think sometimes people can intellectually concede the idea that like, yeah, well, yelling at someone is, isn't good. But there's a gap between our intellectual concession of that understanding and how we actually respond to ourselves when we make a mistake. And so the book talks about Chris, Dr. Kristen Neff's three ways to actually engage in self-compassion. Because self-compassion is another word that's floated around. The people don't really know what that means, I don't think. I'm like, I think people ex hear that word and think of like emotionally petting yourself letting, well, that's what I call it, letting yourself off the hook, kind of just being sweet to yourself. And that's a really watered down version of compassion. Compassion is extremely powerful and you can't heal without compassion. The best you can hope for without compassion is staying at the baseline of whatever you're at. Like you, you just simply cannot move forward without a compassionate response. And so the book talks about the three steps to compassionate response and gives stories about what that's looked like, you know, with the clients that I've worked with, because stories always are what make things resonate for me. And I want to be clear, too, that the stories are fictionalized because I believe that, you know, the people that I've worked with, their stories belong to them and I am never going to share them. But I tried to take the kernel of the, the emotional experience and the kind of constellation of stuff in the story and build around that. And so it was emotional accuracy that I was going for in the stories, not like a detailing of events that actually occurred. Yeah, I get that. And when you work with a specific set of common experiences, like when you're working with perfectionistic people, then there's themes that people share. So it's easier to pull together like a, what do you call it? A composite sketch type thing. Yeah. And, and I think we're all perfectionistic to some level. We're all perfectionistic about something. Whether you consider yourself a perfectionist or not is really about how often you're perfectionistic about it and the degree to which. So it's like a frequency and degree thing. But I think this book is really this kind of speaks to the perfectionist in all of us. We all see the ideal. And there are moments when we all deeply wish that the ideal could happen and, and move through our life as if it could. And we need to know and understand how to kind of brace for the fall when that doesn't happen. Oh, there's so many things I would like to ask you, but I know we're getting near the end of our time. The last thing I want to touch on before we stop is, can you talk a little bit more, you know, we talked about this a bit before we started recording, about the the way that you see perfectionism as being gendered in our culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> perfectionism is such a gendered construct. And because I marketed my practice to women, I noticed so many high achieving, very healthy women telling me, like, I know I need to stop being a perfectionist. And when you hear, when you recognize patterns in your work like that, you, you really can't help but, but take a deeper look. And I think perfectionism has become a cultural placeholder, an implicit cultural placeholder for power and drive in women. And there's this 
invisible model that's operating right now, which is like perfectionism as disease, women as patients, and balance as cure. So it's like this message that all perfectionism is bad and unhealthy, even though there are decades of research on what's called adaptive perfectionism, is how to get perfectionism to benefit you and how to use your perfectionism instead of trying to take this eradication approach, which doesn't even work. And so there's this message of like, let's all stop being perfectionists and let's be balanced instead. And then you look a little closer and you see that the message is really being directed towards women. And it seems like a very healthy directive to tell women to find balance. But unfortunately, we've stripped down the curative center of what balance actually means, which is an energetic equilibrium, right? Like if you say I have achieved balance and you mean it in the curative, wholesome way, what you're saying is I've found my energetic sweet spot. You know, like I feel like myself. I feel good. I'm not too tired. I'm not too hyper. I'm regulated. I feel balanced. But that's not what culture is actually defining as balance. Mm -hmm. Balance has come to mean being really good at being busy. So when you say that someone is really balanced, what you mean is they can add a lot to their plate without dropping the ball. And being good at being busy has nothing to do with actual health. And so I talk at length in the book about how dangerous it is to pathologize high standards for women and call that perfectionism. That's what perfectionism is. And how men simply do not get this message to find balance. And it's a wild goose chase. Like balance does not exist. Anyone listening who feels like I don't have balance in my life, I just need I just need to figure out what the unlock is. There is no unlock. Like, let me just liberate you from that idea. <laughs> it, balance isn't real. And as I talk about in the book, we always think like, oh, balance will come after the holidays. Balance will come after this very serious problem is handled. Balance will come once I take like a personal day. And balance never comes because balance isn't real. And so women just get really stuck in this trap of being pathologized for having ambition, knowing what they want and going for it and having people say they're being too perfectionistic and then telling them to find balance and go on this, you know, hunt for a needle in a haystack. And the haystack doesn't have a needle in it to begin with because balance isn't even real. And so you, if you look at somebody like Gordon Ramsay, not only do we celebrate his perfectionism of exacting high standards and doing all of these things, but he's become like a mogul because of his public persona as a perfectionist. And if you think about, okay, well, who are the celebrated female perfectionists? You might think like Martha Stewart comes to mind. Marie Kondo comes to mind. And these are people who have built companies and public personas around archetypal homemaker things, you know, tidying up, like paint palettes that pop. Martha Stewart's company is about like, oh, you know, you know, hosting brunches and her magazines are about being really beautiful social gatherings. And all of that stuff is great and important, but like it feels very off brand to say that the impressively industrious Martha Stewart was a stockbroker on Wall Street before she started that company, you know, and it's like perfectionism is OK in women as long as we're being per- perfectionistic about the way we look and the way our houses look and the way our kids look. But if you want to, you know, really branch out and be the best and competitive and show your competitiveness like a perfectionist like Serena Williams does or lead a a company like Anna Wintour does, then you better be ready to receive intense criticism as those two women have, because that level of perfectionism and focus and drive is simply not allowed in women without penalty. Yeah. As soon as you said Marie Kondo and Martha Stewart, I also thought I had an immediate reaction of thinking how I thought negative, (laughs) just like how too perfect, you know, they're their personas are. So, you know, I even had that reaction within myself. And as I was listening to you, I'm like, everything you were saying was totally true. And I thinking about the criticism that high achieving women receive, and how you're also not supposed to let that bother you or show that it bothers you, you know, Mm -hmm. you have to be like impenetrable 
to be to be at that level. Yeah, man, our society loves to tear women down. Ugh. Yeah, but the good news is, and you know this because you're daring, you're you're certified in Brene Brown, Dr. Brene Brown's Daring Greatly stuff, where it's it's sort of not really about how we prevent all this stuff as much as how we build resilience around it. And resiliency is about understanding that, yes, this is a misogynistic culture and we are torn down and people, you know, there's not going to be any, um, it's not going to be hard to have that experience. But when you can normalize that experience, and I'm hoping that the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control helps women to understand that this isn't just them, that there's nothing wrong with them. That having ambition and knowing what you want and being really clear and focused about that is a wonderful quality. And that there are a lot of other people who are ready and want to share that quality with you and help you to bring out the most successful version of whoever you want to be out. It's like, that's, I think, where I would like to bring the attention to is how do we build resilience around ourselves and kind of connect? The whole book is about connecting to yourself and understanding yourself better and how that enables us to more meaningfully connect with others. And so I'm really hoping that readers walk away with that understanding. Sounds beautiful. And I can't wait to read it myself as soon as it comes out, which is going to be aligned with when we release this episode. So I know people, when they are listening, will be able to go ahead and order it right away. So, Catherine, it's been so lovely speaking with you, and I know we have to go. Do you have enough time to give me your website and stuff? Because you can email it to me. I can cut this part. Yeah, no, no, no. (laughs) Absolutely. So my website is CatherineMorganShaffler.com. I'm on Instagram at at Catherine Morgan Schaffler. And the book is The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. It's out January 17th. I'm so excited about it. I am so sad we're ending because I have so much more I want to share and I want to hear about and all the things. So I hope we get to talk again. I would really love to get even more into this. Yeah, well, you would be welcome to come back sometime. So thank you for saying that. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us today on Therapy Chat. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Want the latest interventions for working with complex trauma in adolescents and adults? Register for John Briere's five-day workshop in Cancun this February at leadingedgecancun.com and use promo code JOHN50 to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time. You'll save up to $1,500. Space is limited, so register today for 50% off your room when you register for John Briere's complex trauma workshop using code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com. New registrations only. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.